Good evening and welcome to the July 6th, 2021 meeting of the Arlington County Planning Commission. I'm Jim Lantelmi, Chair of the Commission. This is the Planning Commission's only public hearing scheduled for this month. Tonight we'll be hearing an information item on the county's capital improvement program, a recommendation for changes to the zoning ordinance to establish a parklet program, a recommendation to adopt the Pershing Drive Special General Land Use Plan Study, and we'll also have our committee reports and some other business. This will also be, it seems, our last virtual only meeting. Starting with our September meeting, it looks like we will be meeting back in person. Now, it may be possible that we'll have a hybrid format, but most, if not all of us, will be meeting in person. Um, as is standard, we will not be meeting in August. Um, some requirements that I'm required to share with you now for the safety of our staff and residents, we're holding this meeting virtually. Welcome to our commissioners, county staff, applicants, and community members who are all joining us remotely. We're legally authorized to hold this virtual meeting based on the governor's executive orders, legislation adopted by the Virginia General Assembly, and the county board's continuity of operations ordinance that was adopted in March of 2020. So before we begin, I have a few specifics to orient everyone to our virtual environment. Tonight's meeting is available as a broadcast with closed captioning on Comcast Xfinity channels 25 and 1085, Verizon Fios channels 39 and 40, and the county's website. Audio of tonight's meeting is available via phone. If commissioners, presenters, or speakers lose internet connectivity during tonight's meeting, please reconnect with us by phone. I understand you can use the number provided in the team's invite, which is 1-347-973-6905 with a conference ID of 215-118-291-POUND. Registered speakers have received Ms. Johnson's telephone number in their speaker registration confirmation. For other presenters and speakers joining us through Microsoft Teams, Please keep, keep your phones and devices muted until you're called upon. Please turn off sound to any other devices around you to minimize interference. And please go off camera to help preserve um, our, our um, bandwidth. When called upon to speak, you must unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon that's located on your meeting's command bar. The moderator does not have the ability to unmute you. If you're dialing in by phone, press star six to unmute. Commissioners, you know the drill on how to be recognized. For public speakers, you will be called upon by the clerk at an assigned time. Free registration to speak at tonight's hearing was required. We're not able to accommodate additional speakers. Public comments will take place within the same time frames as we would provide at an in-person meeting. Speakers will have three minutes to comment as individuals and five minutes to speak if representing an organization. A speaking timer will be displayed on screen by the clerk. If you're dialing in by phone and unable to see the screen, we will provide an audible warning in 30 seconds or remaining, and then you will be muted when your time has concluded. The meeting chat is active for presenters or commissioners who need technical assistance only. Do not use the meeting chat for discussion for public comment, questions about agenda items, or requests for more information. All public comment must be shared verbally for the record during the assigned public testimony period. And finally, this is a public forum. Tonight's meeting will be recorded and posted with the county's website, and all information associated with tonight's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to Virginia's Freedom of Information Act requirements. Madam Clerk, can you please call tonight's first item? Yes, thank you. Our first item for the meeting is an informational item only, which means the discussion will be between the staff presenting and the commissioners. It is the CIP, the Capital Improvement Program presentation. This will be given by our DMF staff budget analyst, Karen Talley. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ms. Talley. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Karen Talley. I'm the Capital Budget Coordinator for the Department of Management and Finance. Um, I have with me this evening uh, Richard Stevenson, who's the DMF Budget Division Chief, 
and also Jason Fries, who is our debt manager and transportation and metro expert. And Jason will be sharing our presentation uh, this evening. If you could bring up the slides, please, Jason. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as you may recall, uh, last year we adopted a one year CIP given the economic uncertainty due to the pandemic. Um, this year as our community is still recovering from the financial impact, we're again pivoting to modify our traditional 10 year CIP to a proposed three year plan. It's our intent that next year we'll return to the traditional 10 year plan. While the CIP the manager proposed is constrained as a result of the pandemic, it does include continued investments across all the areas included here in this slide. From Metro, which is one of our largest annual investments to our parks, technology, infrastructure and stormwater, all of these investments are towards protecting our assets from premature failure. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the guiding principles that we used in the development of our CIP. Our bonds and CRP are constrained by our financial policies with the ceiling of debt service as a percent of general fund expenditures not exceeding 10%. This year, in addition to our 10% ceiling, we looked more closely at the annual growth of debt service and ways to minimize that growth on the operating budget while we still deal with the, some of the COVID related economic uncertainty. While the investments in this CIP are more modest than in some years, we're still paying debt service from some large recent capital projects such as Lubber Run, Long Bridge and Jenny Dean Park. As the manager talked about during the operating budget process, this CIP also provides a bridge to next year when we hope to have more economic certainty and can again focus on a 10 year CIP plan. The proposed CIP prioritizes projects that address failing end of life infrastructure with continued focus on state of good repair, as, such as some of our significant bridges, trails, technology systems, roofs, and more. This CIP meets legal and regulatory regulatory obligations, most obviously funding Metro, and it focuses on investments as part of planning processes such as Crystal City. It also invests in technology and facilities with consideration of the new work environment post pandemic and provides flex flexibility on how we will use our space. And as as we continue to integrate equity into our decision making process, we did consider the board guiding principles. As you may expect, the county has assets which have been, have been in place for many years and as they reach the end of their useful life and need to be replaced, their location in the county may not perfectly align with an equal distribution of funding. We will, however, continue with priorities um, to prioritize the goals the county board has laid out in our capital asset recommendations. Next slide, please. As is demonstrated in this slide, this three year $1.25 billion proposed CIP is funded by a wide array of sources. The dollars range from general obligation bonds to PAYGO or cash to state and federal funding and other taxes. It's important to note that the majority of these sources are legally restricted in nature. For example, the commercial and industrial tax is legally delegated for transportation projects and the sanitary tax is restricted for stormwater and are not allowed to be used for operating expenses. Also with our bonds, bonds designated as parks bonds must be used for parks and say not for technology projects. All of these details play a role in the types of projects that are funded and at what levels. Next slide, please. For the county, the proposed CIP recommends $62.5 million to be considered for the upcoming 2021 bond referenda this coming November. While this isn't typical to have an off year referenda, the request is largely intended to cover the next year of mandatory funding needs for Metro, 
paving and critical preventative maintenance projects in parks and facilities, and some projects into the fiscal year 2023. As this slide shows, our largest category at more than 50% is for Metro, which is a legal obligation along with our regional partners and transportation, which continues our investment in paving. It also includes modest investments in parks and $17 million lo largely focused on facilities. Next slide, please. Capital contributions have remained in line with the projections included in the last CIP. As we showed on the opening slide, the capital plan funds a variety of programs. Beginning with our regional commitments, we fund Metro through both local support and state funding of over $90 million in this three-year CIP. This includes local bond funding support of just over $20 million each year in fiscal years 22, 23, and 24. Next slide. Stormwater has been of particular focus in our capital plan, especially as a result of changing weather patterns, which has put significant attention to our aging infrastructure. Over the next three years, additional investments of $96 million is proposed for a variety of projects. Some of these include the Cardinal Elementary School's stormwater detention and projects in the Spout Run watershed. In the water sewer area, we continue to implement projects in the solids master plan. We also provide the county share of funding capital improvements to the Washington Aqueduct, the county's wholesale water supplier, as well as a variety of underground infrastructure supporting our water and sewer distribution. Next slide, please. In the general government category, the proposed CIP has over $700 million dollars in transportation street safety projects. This does not include Metro. We continue to invest in our paving program with the combination of bond and pay-as-you-go funding. Though we are proposing a slightly lower bond funding level this CIP for paving, it's projected that we will still maintain our targeted PCI level, that's uh, pavement condition index, we, we're, ma we're targeted to maintain a, a, a targeted PCI level of 75 to, to 80. With a mix of local, federal, and state funding, as stated earlier, we're proposing some significant investments in bridge replacement and renovation program, namely the replacement of the West Glee Bridge Road, Re West Glee Road and the Mount Vernon bridges, along with other bridge maintenance. As we continue our investment along the Columbia Pike Corridor, we are focusing countywide resources to the county's Vision Zero Street Safety Program. And to highlight a couple more transportation projects, we're proposing funding to the county's Art Bus Operations and Maintenance Facility and two new metro station entrances, one at the east end of the Crystal City Metro Rail Station and the other at the intersection of Fairfax Drive and Vermont Street for the west entrance of Boston. Next slide. In our parks and recreation capital area, we continue our investments in parks maintenance capital, master planning, replacements, and expansion of fields in the synthetic turf program, along with our trail and bridge maintenance program. Some specific projects include the planning and design for the Arlington Boathouse, a program which has been talked about and discussed for many years. Also replacement of the Bluemont tennis and picnic areas, along with a number of maintenance projects, including our parks, trail, and bridge maintenance program. Next slide, please. For our community conservation program, we're proposing additional bond funding of $6 million and are using existing balances and previously approved bond funding to support current projects in the neighborhood conservation pipeline. With almost $24 million in funding, the NC program can continue the planning and construction of approved projects and continue working with the community for the out year planning and a variety of important NC areas, including street improvement, street lighting, park and intersection improvement projects. Next slide, please. The county is responsible for over 2 million square feet of facilities, ranging from 24 seven facilities like the detention facility, fire station, group homes, all the way to libraries and community centers, which all require reinvestment. 
For this, CI, for this three year CIP, we focused on the most critical investments in our existing infrastructure. Our aging courts police building, which is almost 30 years old, needs a variety of technology and space upgrades. There is also need to relocate staff from other county buildings into the courthouse complex and funding is included for the planning and space updates and the 2020 North 14th Street building, also known as the Thomas building across the street from courts police. We also have a number of county buildings which need updates and replacements to electrical, mechanical and HVAC systems. And when we're replacing roofs like the plan replacement at the Equipment Bureau, we're planning for solar or solar readiness. Next slide, please. And finally, we continue to invest in our technology and te technology infrastructure. With the workforce and public interaction changes post pandemic, we're proposing a variety of conference and audiovisual investments in other county facilities outside the Bosman Center to support our commissions and public as they interact with county government. Also, investments in a variety of public safety equipment is essential as equipment like public safety radios and fire defibrillators reach the end of their useful life. As we have discussed in previous As we have discussed in previous budgets, there is a need to replace several systems over the next few years, which support the county's financial, human resource, real estate assessment, and court systems. Next slide, please. The 10% ceiling for our debt service as a percent of general government expenditures is a best practice to maintain our AAA rating with the major rating agencies. As stated earlier, our focus was more on constraining our debt service growth and the development of this CIP and the impact on the operating budget. As we transition back to a 10 year CIP, the out year assumptions on debt and affordability will be modified accordingly adhering to the 10 year 10% limit, as well as other county financial policies for debt. Next slide. As we would as we would like to highlight all the work that is currently underway, we have a number of projects across all across all investment areas that are continuing. This slide in the next shows some of the highlights of the many projects the county has in progress. I won't read them all to you, but you can see that in the facilities area, the permanent fire station eight will begin construction this fall. Parks is completing the Long Bridge Aquatics and Fitness Facility in the next few months and Jenny Dean Park this fall. There are numerous stormwater projects underway as the board approved significant investments in this area in the last CIP, including that first phase at Cardinal School, among others. Next slide, please. In transportation, construction is well underway on Columbia Pike and on the Boston Multimodal Improvements, and work has just begun on the West Cleve Road Bridge and the Pentagon City Second Elevator. Many neighborhood conservation projects are in progress, and there are numerous utilities projects underway, including Spout Run Sanitary Sewer Relining. Next slide. We were unable to collect feedback in person this year, though we did use an online survey tool to collect thoughts and priorities, having heard from over 700 participants. You can see a strong interest in our parks, water and wastewater systems, and transit at the top of the list. Next slide. So this is the, the final bit of our schedule. Uh, next week, we have our final board makeup markup um, and we are planning adoption of the CIP on July 17th. And with that, uh, we are available for any questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Talley. Uh, that was a very thorough presentation. Um, it's now with the commission. Um, I see Ms. Uh, Commissioner Peterson has her hand up right away, so uh, it's your turn. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Talley. Uh, I appreciated your presentation as the um, former chair of FAC. Um, I really appreciated hearing all about the budget again. And I also wanted to give a shout out to my former uh, colleague and friend from when I was on FAC, uh, Richard Stevenson. Hi, Richard. Uh, so nice to see you again. 
Um, so my question was um, kind of a bigger picture question about when we are considering our um, capital projects um, from the the budget side, um, how much do you guys interact with the planning department when coming up with our um, negotiations with applicants and developers about what the community benefits are? So do you guys have your priority list in mind about what projects that the county needs and how you guys would like to form some public private partnerships with the applicants in developing um, and getting like stormwater facilities improved upon or parks or, you know, you could tell SPR, the, um, the planning commission, like for this SBRC, it would be great if we could get this part of this project funded. Um, so do you guys work kind of collabor collaboratively like that? So we don't have a very strong connection, but we do work with uh, the planning uh, team uh, with existing site plans that are out there. Um, if there are projects where we are expecting, you know, due to the timeline of a development, if we're expecting to get those dollars in um, to any developer contributions, we would include that as part of our upcoming CIP uh, process and make sure that those projects are included um, in our plan. OK, great. And did so you want to add anything to that, Richard? Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is we're um, Management and finance isn't there on the front end in terms of the negotiation of those public benefits. But once those site plans come forward and are adopted by the board, then we work with um, CPHD senior leadership in the organization as we're developing the CIP to see how those dollars and those public benefits intersect with uh, the plan, the planning that we're doing for the next the next CIP or the next operating budget. OK, I mean, I think there might be an opportunity for you you all if you're interested in getting onto the front side and strategically um, letting letting the planning know what your priorities are so that they could consider that when um, working with the applicant on, you know, the best proposal for the community. Um, and I was also interested, um, you know, we do talk about these public private partnerships for projects that are, are of a capital nature. And would you say um, this current proposed CIP, the short term, is it a, about average for like, you know, leveraging money coming from the private sector? Is it more than usual? Is it a little bit less because, you know, we're kind of fo focusing in on a shorter term and looking at emergency projects? Um, but so, I was, yeah, I was interested in kind of public private partnerships to get some of our needs met. I'd say it's maybe a little less because of the shortened timeline, um, but where projects did fall within the timeline, for instance, Gateway Park, um, that does include developer contribution dollars based on the timing um, for that project. And there are, I believe, a few transportation projects as well um, that include developer contribution. So it's not as much as it would have been across the 10 year, but based on you know where we are, uh, with the years that we're dealing with um, we included them where applicable okay great thanks so much and nice to see you richard mr chairman you're on uh you're on mute ah, <laughs> thank you commissioner peterson thank you commissioner Stroll. um your hand is up and you're next mr Stroll. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Ms. Talley, for your presentation this evening and for being with us. Um, quick, quick question about the Vision Zero funding. Um, wondering if you could go into some greater detail about how that $5 million is uh, likely to be spent. Thank you. I don't have all of those details in front of me. I know it's a mix of funding, um, but it is more focused. That program is more focused on um, specific projects that will um, mitigate um, high, high, uh, high incident areas. So where there are high numbers of crashes or um, if there are areas where there may be fatalities, um, they are focusing on those areas, um, whether it's intersections, um, that, that's where those dollars are focusing, very specifically um, for um, mitigating those types of areas. So it's not so much with the smaller projects, They're, they are larger projects um, in scope, um, but very focused on where they need to mitigate crash areas. 
And do we know, thank you, Ms. Talley, do we know if those intersections are already identified? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can find out though. I would want to, um, just one additional, you know, the that 5 million plus it is, you know, very specific to that, that program, but as uh, it's come up in some of the work sessions with the board and as the manager has stated, there are a lot of other projects in the CIP that align with that goal and aren't specifically tagged to Vision Zero. And one of the comments that we've received from the public and other commissions is in the next CIP, can we can we see how those plans intersect with uh, with each other. And so as we develop the te next 10 year CIP, we hope to advance some of our communication in in making those in making those linkages. Yeah, that's great. Um, so thank you, uh, Mr. Stevenson as well. Um, yeah, I think it's helpful, um, you know, certainly not for this evening, but as we move forward with the CIP and as some of these projects get identified, I think it is helpful for um, the Planning Commission and Transportation Commission and other commissions uh, in the county to just be aware of where investments are going to happen. And um, there are certain intersections that are certainly called out for in our planning documents as ones to uh, improve. And so as we kind of go through those processes, it's just helpful to know um, maybe what public do dollars are going to be kind of handling and so that we can maybe push um, developers to make kind of other contributions like improving um, other elements of the uh, you know, public realm. So I appreciate your work and for being here this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Scholl. Um, are there any other commissioners who wish to speak or ask questions? If not, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Talley and Mr. Stevenson for uh, your excellent presentation. Um, and <laughs> nothing further. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, Madam Clerk, you call the next, the second item. Yes, uh, item number two is an ordinance to amend, reenact, and recodify Chapter 22, Street Development and Construction. This is referred to as a definition for the parklets. We have our DES staff, Bridget Obakoya, to present this item this evening. Welcome, Ms. Obakoya. This is your, your um, debut with the Planning Commission. Uh, to other commissioners, Ms. Obakoya is now the very able um, coordinator for the Transportation Commission. Uh, she, she has uh, taken over from Mr. Best, who retired. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. OK, let me share my screen. And um, I just want to say that I'm also joined tonight by Chris Kreider and Brett Wallace. They too are on the Parklet team and we all work together to develop these guidelines that I'm presenting. So can you see my screen okay? Yes, it's up. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, first I want to talk about what a parklet is. As Giselle already mentioned, this is for um, a request for a new parklet program in the county. Currently, we don't have one. Uh, we do have a parklet pilot, which I will mention briefly in a minute. But a parklet is essentially a place to sit, relax, walk along the sidewalk, and just take in the scenery without being in the sidewalk space. It's um, an ex it's considered an extension of the sidewalk, uh, and it sometimes looks like a parking space, and sometimes they look nothing like a parking space. Here, a parking space. Here are some examples, but it is a semi-permanent installation that is easily dismantled for maintenance and other street emergencies and I will show you some more examples as we go along. The program aims to allow for permanent public outdoor spaces um, within existing public right-of-way. We want to promote more sidewalk activity and activate these spaces, especially along commercial areas, and increase these opportunities for seating and gathering uh, within the public right-of-way. <clears throat> So um, parklets in Arlington is not necessarily a new thing. As I mentioned before, we do have one pilot in Roslyn. 
Um, and in the Public Spaces Master Plan, which was updated in 2019, there was mention of parklets as a way to allow and encourage the activation of public spaces. So what we're presenting to the board um, later this month is really just a continuation of what uh, we've all wanted to do for some time now. Um, and to, we want to, uh, as part of the Public Spaces Master Plan, create a process and guidelines for um, these parklets. So the intention of the amendment to the county code is to do that. Also, in 2015, the Rosalind Sector Plan mentioned parklets. Um, and in 2017, a Streetscapes Elements Master Plan was adopted, which um, spoke to the streetscape elements in Roslyn in which a parklet was included. And, and one of those parklets was installed in 2018, and the county board did approve the installation of that one parklet as a pilot so that we could understand um, how the parklet would be used, what maintenance would be required, what other things needed to be included, what were the safety elements we needed to consider, what other jurisdictions are do doing. So we took that two-year duration, which actually ended up being three years because um, in 2019 we weren't um, out trying to implement any new programs because of the pandemic. So we actually extended the pilot by one year. So um, it was in May of 2018 when we installed um, the first parklet in Roslyn, and it is at the intersection of Oak and Wilson Boulevard, and it is a happening space. I have actually went by there recently, and um, people are just out enjoying the nice weather, having lunch, and um, really taking advantage of the, um, the nice space and the location. So uh, what we did in that two, two to three year period was essentially develop these parklet guidelines. So what we wanted to do was to occupy no more than two parking spaces. So we're saying a minimum of 30 feet for a parklet, but it's about uh, two parking spaces. And we want the space to be fully accessible, fully publicly accessible and ADA accessible and have the appropriate pedestrian clear widths. So what we are recommending is that um, there be accessibility all around the parklet and a four foot clear area for wheelchair access. Also, I, I want to mention that there, the proposal is to not allow any direct commerce to the parklet. Um, you can certainly go to any restaurant in the area or bring your food from home or whatever you like and bring it to the parklet to sit down and enjoy your food. But we don't want restaurants actually providing table service to the parklets because it is a public space. So as you can see here, we have buffers that are perpendicular and parallel to the curb um, to protect the parklet. So it's basically around the perimeter of the parklet. We have these vertical elements on the parklet to uh, provide some uh, vertical protection and also to keep but keeping them low enough so that there is some sight distance visibility for cars riding by. Um, we want there to be some um, openings between the railings and each railing is four inches apart in um, height. And that is um, a co everything that we're providing here is something that we have actually verified in either the building code or uh, the fire code. So we are, are the standards that we're recommending are um, standards that we've actually seen in other jurisdictions around the county and we've um, looked against other codes. So the, and also the access, the ADA accessible design guidelines are also a part of this consideration as well. So there is a four foot turnaround radius within the parklet that also complies with ADA and there are wheel stops um, with the retro reflective striping parallel to the curb so that drivers driving adjacent to the parklet will know of their existence even at night. And so here is a section of a parklet. And one thing we did learn uh, when the Roslyn parklet was first installed was that um, there was some debris that was um, being trapped under the parklet. And um, the ambassadors for the Roslyn bid uh, quickly learned that they needed to keep that clear. So that was a lesson learned for us. So we actually um, documented um, little things that needed to be tweaked in the guidelines while the Rock Roslyn Parklet was installed. And that was one of them because um, someone did 
report uh, sightings of rodents. In the beginning, the uh, ambassadors learned that they needed to uh, clean the parklet on a regular, every other day basis, uh, uh, which they are doing. And since the, the first installation, the, the first few weeks of the installation of the parklet, um, we haven't heard of any complaints or anything. So apparently that really worked and keeping the debris free underneath. So we want to make sure that drainage is not an issue. There, there are no tripping hazards. Um, the parklet must be flush to the sidewalk. So um, there is only actually, and this is not shown here, but in the guidelines that we've created, um, the administrative guidelines for the applicant or anyone who wants to go and check it out on our website, um, you, there's only a half of inch uh, gap that is the maximum that you can have between the parklet edge and the sidewalk edge. And again, like I said, the railings uh, have to be three and a half feet or less in height. So uh, this, is also something that's important to mention. This is actually the Roslyn Parklet while it was in the factory being built. Um, and they were, they put it together and then they dismantled a part of it to ship it and bring it here to the site um, for installation. The applicant is fully responsible for the installation, maintenance, removal, and storage of the parklet under all circumstances. So if there is an emergency or something that needs to happen in the street, we are asking the applicant to um, remove the parklet and we are proposing a 48 to 72 hour uh, period for that to occur. So it should be an immediate removal. So those are all conditions that we've put in the application for um, the applicant as part of the application process. And this will be an annual renewal and it is subject to periodic inspection, um, similar to what we're doing with the Roslyn parklet now, even though this is a pilot, uh, we do want uh, to have eyes on the street on a regular basis so that we can fully understand um, how the parklet is operating and if it is indeed um, safe. So we have a petition and application process. The petition is requesting that 67% uh, one third of the fronting block establishments be in support of the parklet and that if the parklet is installed within a bid area that the bid just acknowledge that the parklet um, applicant is submitting an application. So the there is an online application form that um, we have created and there is a parklet website that's up where the form will reside and essentially all of the you know, petitions, the online application form, the pictures of the existing condition, um, the design for the parklet, landscaping and materials plan and the loads and framing plan will all be submitted as part of the application. Once the application is approved, we are requesting that um, the applicant sign a maintenance agreement and provide a certificate of insurance um, for the um, parklet and for operations. So we are proposing that the parklet fees for the initial fee be $2,100 and that the renewal for the parklet is $500. And that is an annual cost, the $500 after renewal. Um, we will forego any parking meter revenue at the parklet if it is being installed adjacent to existing parking meters. And as I said earlier, we anticipate two parking spaces currently for the parklet. So this $6,146 is about 61% of what the full cost of removing two parking meters from the public right of way would be in a year. The full cost is, is $9,000 plus. Dollars. And what I did was, was take the average of the uh, amount of time cars park in the public right of way for, on a weekday and the weekend and determined that it was about 61% of the time. So that's how we came up with this number. But it is important to note that these fees are not in line with what we've seen with neighboring jurisdictions. DC, for instance, charges uh, $50 per year for their parklets. Alexandria charges $125 from um, spring to Thanksgiving. And Richmond charges $300 for a parklet installation and they have a renewal process every three years. So that's about $100 per year. 
and we have already spoken with the pedestrian advisory committee the disability advisory commission parks and recreation commission transportation commission and we um, have advertised and the comments that i've received to date um, will be incorporated um, have been incorporated in this presentation and I will make some recommendations and provide some options to the board based on what I've heard. One thing we have heard from the Transportation Commission that is not reflected here, we um, have met with them twice, first as an information item and secondly as an action item um, and they did vote to uh, in support of the parklet but one thing that was a concern was the fee and that um, it was cost prohibitive for the average person who wanted to apply for the parklet and and that it seemed to be geared toward um, the bids and larger corporations who could actually afford to pay for the application design a parklet install the parklet and maintain it on a regular basis. So um, with that, I am opening up the uh, presentation for questions and um, look forward to what you have to say. Uh, thank you, Ms. LaCroix, for a very good presentation. Um, it's now with the commission, uh, but for, actually, no, it's not first. We have, do we have any public comments, um, Madam Clerk? No, not this evening. OK, and uh, do we have any commissions um, want to speak to this. I don't hear anybody or see anybody. Um, as Ms. Obakoya mentioned, this was before the Transportation Commission last week, um, and she gave a very good summary of what the substantive discussion about it was. Um, ultimately, the Commission did vote unanimously to uh, support the recommendation and move this forward to make the, the zoning changes to implement this program. Um, the item is now before the Commission. And um, do we have anybody who would like to ask questions or make comments? Uh, Commissioner Bagley. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, I appreciate, uh, and also staff, I appreciate the um, presentation. Um, yeah, I just, and it's a procedural question. Would this ever come to the Planning Commission, I guess, as a minor site plan amendment or something? How, I, just a procedural question, would we ever weigh in on this for the request for a parklet? I don't anticipate it unless it's a part of an existing site plan that um, needs to have an amendment for the installation of the parklet. Okay, and then I guess my next question, would this ever be considered, um, by the stretch of the imagination as an open space part of a requirement in a development? That is a really good question and I have not actually heard that before. I have always couched this as an extension of the sidewalk, um, but not in, a, in addition to um, open space. However, the public spaces master plan does speak to the need for more open spaces and it did include parklets, but to technically call it a part of the uh, percentage for open space is a different question. So I, that's a good one and I need to follow up on that. Oh, good. I'm glad I gave you a stumper. <laughs> Thank you um, so much. <laughs> I, I think I can answer that. The answer would be no, <laughs> because uh, the parklets are already going to they can only appear in, in the public space. So that, that public realm is already accounted for. And since the streets are part of that, um, wherever a parklet's gonna go, there, there's no additional benefit to, that could be accrued from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. That does, thank you. Thank yeah, you, Chris. That, yeah, that sounds right also, because I think that these could be removed at any time. Um, there's really no inherent reason why they would be considered permanent installations. Um, it, so I think that makes sense. Uh, Commissioner Morton. Uh, thank you very much uh, to staff for a great presentation. Um, I, I'm asking it because someone's gonna ask about the cost, why so much more than other jurisdictions? So that's not my main question, but I'll put it out there in case no one else asks it. Um, I appreciate the sign, sorry, I've got a siren going by. Um, 
and your attempt to be inclusive, it would be great, I think, once we have several of these to try to do a little bit of public awareness campaign. Even though there's a sign, people still are hesitant to approach something that seems like it could be private space. Um, and I also appreciated the lessons learned. That was very helpful. It seems like a good outcome of a pilot project. Um, my question is, um, with what we've learned with respect to COVID and how we use public space, I've seen that you're limiting the um, vertical elements and you have a, a well-founded uh, uh, stress on visual permeability and accessibility. I'm wondering if the idea of weatherproofing has crossed your mind in terms of, is there a tension? I know, you know a lot of us have eaten in places in DC where there is sort of a canopy, a little bit of a shade. Um, it, it, I'm wondering what your thoughts were on that. Are some of these requirements making it a little bit harder to use them in bad weather? Thanks, Brett, that's it. Brett, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, sure. I think um, in looking at some of the other parklet guidelines across the country, we uh, looked at some of the furnishings, which we want to give um, applicants flexibility on. But I think providing um, umbrellas or something that you typically see in some plazas that are uh, part of a table and chair arrangement um, are a possibility. Um, I think having a, a more permanent canopy structure um, may be more problematic when it comes to some of our existing zoning and um, uh, building uh, inspection services requirements in terms of where what, what's considered a structure. Um, so that would be something we would have to look a little bit further into um, on whether or not a more, a more of a permanent canopy structure or pergola or something like that would be allowed. Um, so that's a good good question. If I could just interrupt for one moment, staff, as you speak or comment during the discussion, please identify yourself for the record. Thank you. Um, thank you, that's helpful. I'm wondering if even on a seasonal basis that could be, I, I understand the reluctance to put in something permanent, but I, I'm wondering if there's if there would be flexibility to, um, uh, enhance this during season. So I also had the question about the cost. Thanks. Yeah, why cost so much? That's that's a good question. Um, we determine the cost based on what what especially Brett and I um, see to be the amount of time we spend in plan review. Um, so we anticipated all of the people who would be involved in the review, and we looked at what we actually review for the Roslyn Parklet and determined that um, based on all of our time. And then the inspection initially for the location of the parklet, um, it would be about $2,100. And for the renewal, it would be it would not be nearly as much. Um, it came out to $500. The and so why we're proposing that is because we needed to recover some of the cost for um, the the amount of time for the parklet. Um, understanding that we would still be foregoing the cost of the parking meters. And we do recognize that this is a tremendous community benefit and um, also recognize um, that cost could be prohibitive. Um, and we, we want to make sure the board knows that um, our staff time is accounted for and that um, we really do appreciate um, the park list as a tremendous count, um, community benefit. So we had to weigh both of those and we decided as a team that we would go forward with the cost of staff time, not parking meters, and then mention the tremendous community benefit. Uh, I actually do have a question um, following up on that. We keep talking about the revenue that would be foregone by having it take up the metered spot. Mm. Is it possible for parklets to be in spots that are not covered by meters? That's right. Um, they can be. Just looking at where parklets um, want to be in, in bid areas and in commercial cores, um, most of those spaces are metered. Um, but 
you know, we still have places where there are not parking meters and we have not put any limitations on where parklets can go outside of residential areas. So there are opportunities for parklets in other areas, yes. And do we have an option for a temporary park, like someone who would only want it up for three months, let's say, or for a special event? I have seen those called pop-up parks, and we do have a process for um, special events currently for that kind of thing. Um, a parklet, because it is a semi-permanent um, installation and it does require um, so much design and maintenance and the installation, um, this we think would be a separate process and something that's a much shorter term. We want to um, use the special events for that. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, the commission? Um, hearing none, uh, do we have a motion? Sorry, I was slow on the hand. Can I okay. still? Commissioner Steinberger, go ahead. Um, I, and I appreciate the Commissioner Morton did ask about the expense since I, I certainly um, I think this there is great opportunity for growth and community benefit from this and I'm excited that this will be in you know the pilot was successful and this is kind of coming to Arlington on a, a permanent basis so to speak a permanent removable basis <laughs> um, but um, I I would like to see that um, maybe if as we get have more experience in going through these reviews if there are um, uh, economies of scale that could go into reducing some of the cost for this because I think that this could be something where more people would take advantage of it if we could get the price point down a bit more um, and I could see it even as, as something that you know individual communities or an HOA or what, what have you might you know per, per, um, pursue but I think that's really contingent if we can get the price point to somewhere where it feels like that's something that's more reasonable. So I, I would hope that we could move and maybe we'd be able to move in that direction as we do more of these, that that would be possible. So I just want to advocate for that and say I'm excited about it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Steinberg. Um, do we have any uh, other, other commissioners who would like to weigh in? If not, I, I could go. Uh, Commissioner Peterson. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to say that I am currently comfortable with the price point being charged as a, um, at least for the first year to see if we, if it does end up being cost prohibitive. Um, I really appreciate the efforts to um, cover staff hours. I think that's really important. Um, I, I think it's also important to note the lost revenue that the county is giving up by losing the parking spaces. I think it's, it's excellent to have these parklets. I think it's really creative. I think it's fun. I would love to see them in my neighborhood, but I also think Arlington has some of the best parks in the country. We are, every year we're known for having the best parks. And so because of that, since I do think there are some other options for our community members, let's try the higher price point. I, I think that's a good idea. If it's not working, we still really want the parklets. We can lower the price point, um, but if it's working, then we are, are getting some additional revenue or at least not losing as much revenue and we're covering more of our costs and and we're getting the community benefit as well. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. Um, anyone else? Okay, I think we can now move on to motions. Uh, do we have a motion? Okay, Commissioner Weir. Um, so I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the County Board uh, uh, adopt the <coughs> ordinance um, uh, attached to the staff report to amend, reenact, and recodify Chapter 22, uh, uh, Street Development and Construction of the Arlington County Code in order to establish a parklet program by one adding a section 22-5.L construction to define parklets as an extension of sidewalks within the public right of way and authorizing the county manager to establish an administrator parklet guidelines and procedures. Uh, uh, see attachment A to the staff report. Uh, and three, um, I'm going to read it as it's written in the staff report. Uh, three, amending the Department of Environmental Services Consolidated Development Related Fee Schedule 
to establish a fee for new and renewing applications for parklets in the public right of way um, reference to attachment B of the staff report. Do we have a second? Everyone's on mute. Someone has a second. Second. Commissioner Thank Steinberger, second. Thank you, Commissioner Steinberger. Um, do we have any discussion? I will weigh in because say that I will be enthusiastically supporting this. Um, I first ran into a parklet when I was visiting San Francisco, and I was just almost dumbfounded that it looked like, wow, such an obvious and great idea. It was popular, it was being used. Um, it was along a, a commercial strip with a fairly narrow sidewalk, and it looked good, and it seemed to be working wonderfully. And now I've seen the Roslyn parklet a number of times, and think that it definitely adds to the public realm. So I will definitely be voting aye for this. Um, do we have any, any other discussion on this? If not, let's move on to a vote. Commissioner uh, Aye. Commissioner uh, Schroll. Aye. Commissioner uh, Morgan. Aye. Commissioner Steinberger. Aye. Commissioner Bagley. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sarley. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you very much to staff, um, Ms. Opakoya, uh, Mr. Kreider, and Mr. Wallace. Uh, this has been great work, uh, and it's been a long road to, get, to finally get to this, delayed by at least a year due to the pandemic. But um, I, um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how many more we can get out on our streets um, and see if we need to come back for modifications of, of the fee structure. But right now, I think that uh, we're well positioned to move forward on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Um, Madam Clerk, can you raise the third item? Item number three will be the adoption of the Persing Drive Special General Land Use Plan Study Document. We have Margaret Rhodes, our Planning Division staff, to present this item this evening. Thank you, Ms. Rhodes. The um, uh, screen is yours. Good evening. Let's see. Can you, let's see. It looks like it's still the old presentation up there. Chris, do you want to give it a go? I am trying to share my screen, but I keep um, Riz of Akoya needs to uh, unshare her screen and then we can bring yours up. Bridget, can you take down your screen? Thank you. There you go. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Let's try this. Okay. All right, Chris, I'm still going to ask you to do it. <laughs> it is not letting me share. Okay, let me uh, pull it up. Let me see. And then you can, Let me and see. you can just uh, ask me to advance. Let's see. There it is. I, there we go. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can make it bigger. Um, I think you're full screen now. Okay, great. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Margaret Rhodes with the Planning Division. And we are here tonight to discuss um, the Pershing Drive Special General Land Use Plan Study. Last month we were here and we gave you an overview where we advertised, uh, we brought for advertisement um, the special general land use plan study document and the associated uh, GLOP amendment. And here we can see the, um, the site 
It is located at the intersection of North Pershing Drive and Arlington Boulevard. And the GLOP amendment request uh, that the applicant submitted was for an amendment from service commercial and low medium residential to low office apartment hotel with an associated rezoning. And a special general land use plan study was undertaken and needed because this is an area without an adopted plan. In terms of the study, we looked at the low office apartment hotel and we brought this to the planning commission and the county board last month and there was support for the advertisement. And uh, now we were bringing forward the um, this associated document um, for adoption. Uh, Ms. Rhodes, your slides are not advancing. <laughs> OK, let's see. Can you see? They are advancing on my screen. Um, let's see. Can you see them now? No. No. All right. I can pull mine up. Um, right. it's on, okay, slide three. <laughs> yes. Actually, we can move to slide five. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. So in terms of the stakeholders we've involved, we've had a number of stakeholders um, as part of the long range planning committee um, process. And we've had at the table representatives from the transportation commission, the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committees, park and recreation, HLRB, and the Lion Park Civic Association, and also over the course of the process, we engaged Joint Base Fort Myer Henderson Hall, numerous community members, and various county departments and divisions. Next slide. In terms of our community engagement, we had four LRPC meetings three online engagement opportunities uh, where we reached out to a broad range of participants. Uh, we had public hearings last month in June and uh, we had we were invited by the Park and Recreation Commission um, for a meeting there in June, which we just had. And again, we're, we're back here in July with um, bringing forward the adoption of the study document. Next slide. Oh, let's see. Someone says that the slides do not appear to be advancing. No, it's it, it is now. But okay. It's general use land use plan. Okay. Are we on the general land use plan slide? Yes. Okay, great. So here, and I'll be brief. We can see the site here is um, outlined in red, and there is a split club designation: service commercial and um, low medium residential. And here you can see that it's also split zoned. So we have the RA615 and the C2. And in terms of the advertised GLUP amendment, um, this was brought forward last month. And based on the input we had received during the process and through the online engagement surveys, we recommended to the county board that um, it was uh, appropriate to advertise an amendment to low office apartment hotel provided that there is an appropriate accompanying site plan and low office apartment hotel we thought was appropriate for this area for a number of reasons one of which is that it allows for a mix of uses including retail or retail equivalent it also allows for scale of development compatible with the context and accommodated by the transportation network so there's a robust transportation nexus here um, and then in terms of the study document, um, we think that this is a very important component here in addition to the GLUP amendment because it provides the context and the recommendations um, that will allow us to ensure that whatever is developed on this site does have a compatible scale, does transition appropriately to the neighborhood, and does provide those necessary improvements to the public realm. So here you can see what we analyzed over the course of the study existing and the proposed um, and now advertised GLUP amendment. 
and now we will talk about the study document. So the study document is important in terms of providing that context and those recommendations that will make sure that any potential pro future project is developed appropriately. So we developed this study document with input that we received over the course of the LRPC process and through our three online community engagement opportunities. It's also, of course, based on good planning and solid urban design. And it takes into context the surrounding area of Lion Park. The guiding principles focus around these six areas. And now we'll provide you a little bit more in depth on each of these areas. So land use and use mix. Uh, it's important to provide a compatible mix of uses and the community um, was very interested in having some retail or retail equivalent space along Pershing Drive to relate to what's already there across Pershing Drive at the 2201 project. Uh, building heights, placement, form, and design also very important in ensuring that we have a high quality mixed use neighborhood gateway here. Um, it's also, of course, very important to transition appropriately to the surrounding neighborhood on all four sides of the project. Here you can see the building's heights map, and this is something that we um, refined to make sure we, we had a little correction to make in the advertised version. So we wanted to make sure that we captured that small four-story um, taper on the south end. So you can see that here. The concept plan includes a number of different features. So we see, um, you know, the removal of that stub road, Wainwright Road. We see the new casual use public open space at the corner of Pershing and Arlington Boulevard, or, or sorry, at the corner of North Wayne and North Pershing. And we see a, an improved public corner there at North Pershing and Arlington Boulevard. Um, major improvements to the multi-use trail are envisioned. Um, that frontage there on Arlington Boulevard um, would be improved with landscaping, berming, um, a biophilic meadow with um, native plants, pollinator plants, including milkweed. There'd be improvements to the bus stop there on Arlington Boulevard in terms of safety and access. And just in general, a number of pedestrian safety and bike access improvements. Uh, we also think it's important, of course, for the building to taper down towards the neighborhood on North Wayne and then towards the Washington Lee Historic Garden Apartments to the south. Um, and then we're also providing, um, envisioning a new access road along the southern property line that would also connect the neighborhood directly and safely to the Arlington Boulevard Trail. And now um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Kreider from Urban Design, and he's going to very briefly uh, walk us through uh, some of the models. I think you're on mute, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by the way, my name is Chris Kreider. I apologize for being on mute, um, but you didn't miss much. Um, wanted to point out that the the building uh, that, that we're hoping to preserve with the blade sign is, is remaining in situ at its current location and would be part of the new overall uh, redevelopment. The other thing to note is trying to match the height across the, uh, the street at North Pershing, and then stepping up uh, to the broader scale of Arlington Boulevard, which is much wider, but then again, stepping down. Um, this, this view in the, in the bottom shows a good uh, impression of what that public space might be, along with a, uh, a permeable pavement type of plaza that could be used for uh, festivals, uh, food trucks, food trucks, and other types of activities. This shows the Arlington Boulevard elevation, and then Ms. Rose is talking about it stepping down on this last piece. 
Uh, this is something that we discussed at the L last LRPC mail meeting and had modeled, but had not updated the, uh, the heights map. And then finally, the, uh, this is a view from the neighborhood looking towards the northeast. You see the, uh, the Washington Lee Apartments. You also see the idea of, uh, of this muse that would connect through the main building to Arlington Boulevard and the Montague's Trail, as well as the notion of having a walkout type townhome type units uh, facing the muse. And that's a, a way to sort of more graciously transition to, uh, to the apartments and to the neighborhood as opposed to sort of turning your back on it. And I'll turn it back over to Ms. Rhodes to go through uh, some of the key principles from each of the, the various elements. Great, thank you. So in terms of transportation principles, um, some of the important aspects are really enhancing that multimodal access, <clears throat> connectivity and safety. And of course, we already talked about improving the trail, the sidewalk and the bus stop and making sure that all service and loading access is within the site and that parking is undergrounded. In terms of public spaces, biophilia and sustainability, we have a number of um, recommendations here. So probably the most um, uh, noticeable of which would be that casual use open space that you see at the intersection of Wayne and Pershing. The greenway that we talked about along Arlington Boulevard um, expansion of the tree canopy, the use of sustainable design, again, the addition of native trees and pollinator friendly species, um, using creative stormwater management techniques, and considering the inclusion of, of public art. Um, as Mr. Kreider alluded to, historic preservation is also very important here. So this, um, the Arva Motel that was built here, um, is one is is on our historic resources inventory is listed as notable and so we are recommending the preservation of the um iconic blade sign and the two-story mid-century modern lobby um, and we're also recommending that any new development here would complement the the architectural character of the historic garden apartments nearby and fort meyer across arlington boulevard Affordable housing is also an important component here. And as with any um, uh, plan where there is um, a GLUP amendment associated with the project, we would be requiring 20% of the floor area over the base to be provided as affordable. In terms of the recommended refinements that we have to the study document, um, you can see that we have a few refinements here. So the building heights map and Arlington Boulevard urban design area improvements. We updated that to show four stories on the southern edge of Arlington Boulevard to accurately reflect the last um, LRPC conversation. We're also showing a casual use open space. Um, and you know, we wanted to make sure, and this was at the um, recommendation of the Park and Recreation Commission, that we actually included the proposed size in the plan. So um, the size was, you know, evident with the concept plan that we had made, but we wanted to be really specific and say, you know, what it was, which is 10% of the site area. And that we also want to make sure that it's a nice square usable space um, and then we also wanted to mention that that the adjacent driveway could be used potentially at times as a shared plaza. Wildlife sustainability was also something that the Park and Recreation Commission um, suggested that we um, include. And so we're recommending incorporating bird friendly glass. And then other information that we added from what was advertised, um, we've added information about the flight path location. So we spoke with um, the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority and what the height that we were recommending was confirmed to be um, appropriate uh, here. Um, and of course, however, um, Federal Aviation Administration determination will be required as part of any uh, site plan approval. 
We also wanted to add in some Arlington Public School student numbers. So you can see here seven, four and 11 students would are projected for this site. Um, should it develop out per the concept plan we have included? And we wanted to add a reference to Vision Zero. So the first, the county's first Vision Zero action plan was adopted in May, and um, we just wanted to add a reference to that, although we already included a number of uh, very strong pedestrian and bicycle safety um, recommendations. And in terms of next steps, here we are. So we um, brought forward the request to advertise in June, and now we're here before you um, with final action on the study document. And that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rhodes. Um, do we have any public comments for this, Madam Clerk? Uh, no, not this evening. We do not. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Commissions. Uh, I do know that the uh, Parks and Rec had comments. Uh, Commissioner Bagley, you will be giving those comments on their behalf. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, PRC really would like to emphasize the concept of being more specific in this and any future comparable document language about community expectations for open space, size, and shape. And in a letter dated today sent by them to the county board, a couple of excerpts, uh, the vision shown in the proposed plan provides several promising open space concepts. We anticipate that the language encouraging biophilic design elements into all aspects of site development will contribute to the future success of subsequent projects. The biophilic design elements should be considered throughout the design process and we welcome various implementations and uses of these elements. Uh, also, the Commission appreciates that our proposed change in the description of the open space to more specifically define the size, 10% of the site, and configuration, i.e. square, contiguous, of this space has been incorporated by staff. We believe that such open space specifications are important for all planning documents, just as they are when developing building heights, setbacks, street widths, and other definitions. Uh, and the, let's see, the commission also supports our suggested addition of language calling for bird friendly architectural and material design for future building to help codify the county's expectations to developers with respect to a broadly supported community principle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Bagley. Are there any other commissions um, before us tonight? This was not before the Transportation Commission. Um, hearing none, um, Commissioner Schroll, do you have any updates for the LRPC report? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. Um, this did not you know, come back to the Long Range Planning Committee um, since our last meeting. Right. Um, you know, the, as the staff report noted, um, there was pretty limited discussion on this matter. Um, at our meeting last month. And I think Ms. Rhodes um, did a good job of walking through the changes that have been incorporated um, into the draft um, since um, we met last month. Um, for my fellow planning commissioners, um, the staff report on page seven um, also does a nice job of outlining uh, the, the changes that staff have made. And it sounds like, um, as Ms. Rhodes noted, there were some others that have been made uh, uh, subsequently. Um, I don't necessarily have um, a discussion outline this evening um, or proposed topics um, given the unanimity of our support for unanimity of support for um, this um, last month and without amendment. So um, Mr. Chairman, I'll kind of pass it back to you, but um, you know, I anticipate um, or I will be moving the county manager's recommendation and um, without amendment at this point. Thank you, Commissioner Schroll. Um, uh, thanks for the update. And yes, I agree. There was no need to go back deeply into it again. Um, are there, this is now before the commission. 
Um, are there any questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Peterson, right off the mark, go ahead. The, Thank uh, you, Chair. Uh, uh, I just wanted to make sure you saw Matt Roberts' comment that the applicant wanted to speak briefly to the plan. Um, yes, I think that would be appropriate um, since he is the applicant. Um, uh, Mr. Roberts, um, are you available right now? Uh, yes, Commissioner Lantelmi, thank you very much. Um, we will be very, very brief. We just wanted to uh, go on record with the commission as uh, giving our thanks uh, to both the LRPC, the commission, the community, uh, and in particular staff uh, for all their hard work on this. Uh, we think it's a really good plan. We're very much looking forward to implementing it uh, during an upcoming 4.1 process. Uh, again, just wanted to give our overall thanks to everybody for their input. Uh, as always, uh, this is one of those things that comes out better in the wash for having all the public participation. Uh, so with that, you know, uh, we'll, we'll turn it back over. But if there are any questions, comments, things that uh, we can address in the meantime, we're certainly available to answer them. So thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Um, OK, back to the commission. Um, are there any commissioners who would like to make comments or have questions of either staff or the applicant? Um, seeing none, um, I'd just like to make a comment that um, I very much want to thank um, the staff here, uh, Ms. Rhodes, uh, Mr. Kreider, and Mr. Wallace, and, um, and the applicant for working on this. Um, coming with what I think are some very, very creative um, proposals, ideas for this site that if they are in fact implemented will make for a very, very interesting, very walkable, very um, attractive uh, neighborhood. Um, you know, Lion Park is certainly a neighborhood right now, but this will go a long way to enhancing what is already a very attractive neighborhood, I, I believe. Um, and we'll get some affordable housing out of this too, uh, to boot, um, is what my hope and expectation is. Um, that said, um, do we have a motion? Uh, if no one has any further comments. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Schroll. Um, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the County Board adopt the attached ordinance uh, sorry, the attached resolution to the staff report dated June 28th, 2021, attachment one, uh, to adopt the Pershing Drive Special General Land Use Plan Study Document as shown in attachment A with the revisions outlined in attachment B. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Patel. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I just may speak to this briefly. Um, yes, you may. Um, I just want to, um, as I, I think said last month, I want to compliment staff um, for their great work on this. Ms. Ms. Rhodes, um, Mr. Kreider, um, you know, Mr. Lopez, um, Ms. Schaub. I also want to thank um, uh, Commissioner Sarley for his help on this project as well as he was co-chairing this effort um, and all the um, folks who participated in the LRPC. Um, this is a very collaborative process um, and I think uh, as we're here this evening and as we were last um, last month, um, you know, we had kind of limited feedback at that stage and I think that's a testament to um, the good work by staff but also the collaborative um, um, process um, and productive process um, we had over the past several months. So um, as Ms. Rhodes noted, this um, project or this plan um, envisions some really neat investments in this area, which you know, I hope we get with a 4.1 application at some point. Uh, we won't go over them again, but I think there's some critical ones that will, will help this intersection in this point in the county. Um, so again, I want to thanks folks for their time um, over the, you know, the, the many meetings. Um, and I'm you know, certainly happy to support this, uh, this plan. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Schroll. I certainly would want to second everything that you had said and also give a shout out to the Lion Park Citizens Association um, and, and the, the community surrounding the site uh, for their thoughtful comments and their participation in this. 
Um, if there's no further comments or discussion, I see none. Uh, let's move on to a vote. Uh, Commissioner Weir. Aye. Commissioner Stroll. Aye. Commissioner Morton. Aye. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Steinberger. Aye. Commissioner Bagley. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sarley. Aye. And I vote aye as well. It, the motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you, staff, applicant, and all others who participated. Um, this matter is concluded. And that means we can now move on to our administrative items. Um, I think the first thing we can do is do the minutes from our May 3rd and 5th meetings, as well as our June 2nd and 3rd meetings. Um, I did forward some non-substantive edits to our clerk earlier this afternoon. Um, are there any further changes that any commissioners have noted that they'd like to make? Okay, um, seeing none, um, do we have a motion for the May 3rd meeting? Well, I will then move that we that the, the planning commission accept the uh, minutes of the May our May 3rd planning commission meeting. We Second. Accept. Thank you. That was Commissioner Patel. Thank you, Commissioner Patel. Um, let's move ahead on a vote for that. Commissioner Weir. Aye. Commissioner Schroll. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Morton. Aye. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Steinberger. Aye. Commissioner Bagley. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sarley. Aye. I vote aye as well. For our May, um, I'll also move that we accept the minutes of our May 5th meeting. Second. Thank you. Our vote is Commissioner Weir. Uh, or mute. Commissioner Weir. Come back to me, please. I'm, I, I have a, a question about something in, in the minutes. I may need to ask to have my vote revisited. Um, so come come back to me, please, if you don't mind. OK, uh, Commissioner Schroll. Um, I vote aye, but Mr. Chairman, for this one, um, Mr. Commissioner Weir should vote uh, abstain since he was absent. That's, thank you. That 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 is exactly. I, I thank you, Commissioner Schroll. This is the one that I was wondering about, and and my vote will be to abstain. Okay, uh, Commissioner Schroll. I vote aye. Commissioner Morky. Aye. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Steinberger. Aye. Commissioner Bagley. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sarley. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Um, I now move that the um, that the commission accept the minutes for our June second meeting. Second. Um, vote is Commissioner Weir. Aye. Commissioner Stroll. Aye. Commissioner Morton. Aye. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Steinberger. Aye. Commissioner Bagley. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Sarley. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Um, Commissioner Weir, do you want to make the motion for the final for the June um, third meeting since I was not there? That would be appropriate. Uh, I move that the commission adopt the uh, minutes of its June third meeting. Second. Uh, Commissioner Weir. Um, aye. Commissioner Schroll. Aye. Commissioner Morton. Aye. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Steinberger. Abstain. Commissioner Bagley. Aye. Commissioner Peterson. Abstain. 
Commissioner Sarli? Aye. And I abstain as well. Um, good, the minutes are now done. Um, do we have a staff report on current matters? Uh, uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, are you there? Do we have anything this month from you? I am, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chairman Lentelmi, um, I just very, very quick um, update on some staffing um, on our side. Uh, uh, as everybody knows, um, we now have a new planning director in place. Mr. Fusarelli, who I think is on the call, uh, has now been planning director for, I think, going on three weeks. Uh, so we, we're happy to have him on board. Um, and again, thank you to um, Jen Smith, who uh, was our planning director in the interim period. Uh, beyond that, we are uh, looking, We, as many of you know, um, Ms. Chrissy Wallentish on the site plan team has departed staff. Uh, so she is no longer with us, unfortunately, but we're recruiting her position. Um, and we have one more position out on the comp planning team. So uh, we'll get some new folks on board and, and I think uh, they'll be excited to meet everyone. So that is my update. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pfeiffer. Um, a number of you did circulate around um, reports for your various committees, but if you could just do a quick, quick summary of those. Um, Commissioner Bork for the SBR Food. Thank you, Chair Lynn. Tell me, um, I've got a very brief report, which is it's unlikely that we'll have any SPRC meetings before um, September. There's a small chance there'll be a project coming before us at the end end of this month, um, which is the Wendy side in courthouse, but I believe that it's more likely that we'll hear that in September. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Morton. Um, Commissioner Schroll for the LRPC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I did circulate a uh, report earlier today. Um, few items that I'd like to give an update on and then I'd like to pass it off to Commissioner Sarley to see if he has anything to add on the Penn Place project which we'll hear next week. Um, so on July 27th we're going to have our next meeting for the Clarendon sector plan update um, on July 28th. Uh, we will have our next meeting on the Crystal City Building Heights study. Um, so please hold those days. Um, I'm still working with staff um, to find a day um, the week before that. So it's either going to be July 21st or July 22nd um, to have an LRPC meeting to discuss the planning division's work plan. Uh, we normally would do this in the um, you know January, February, February timeframe. We're kind of pushing it off a little bit this year, but um, so please either hold the 21st or hold the 21st and the 22nd at this at this stage. Um, and more to come on that. Um, and then in September, we envision having a few more meetings um, and uh, certainly or hopefully one on the multifamily reinvestment study, um, which used to be the H HCD um, study. Um, so with that, I'd like to pass it off to Commissioner Sarley, who is the co-chair for the Penn Place LRPC to see if he has any update on next week's meeting. Commissioner Sarley. Thank you, Commissioner Schro. No, I don't have any updates as of yet. I think we have a strategy planning session with staff that we're going to work on, I believe, Monday. I'm um, sort of not at my desk, so I'm having a little bit... Um, I don't have the calendar in front of me, um, but I think, yeah, we're, we're ready to um, get going on the 13th, as you mentioned. Other than that, no updates so far. Thank you both. Um, for Zoko, Commissioners uh, Weir and Patel. Um, I don't want to speak for Commissioner Weir, but I don't think we have an update at this point. Same. Okay. And Commissioner Steinberger, PFRC. Thank you. Um, so we had a PFRC meeting, the third one um, for the Shillington bus depot. Um, the There were still some issues that are remain somewhat kind of unresolved with the community, some involving kind of a level of community engagement, uh, transportation, and a little bit on um, parking and, and the analysis that went into determining the appropriate amount of spaces uh, proposed for the site, um, as well as a uh, tree canopy uh, updates as I believe a meeting with county, the county arborist had been postponed. So some of that information was not available at the time of the meeting. 
Um, it is likely we will do an abbreviated fourth meeting with a limited agenda um, at some point in the future. That is still being worked out. When I have more information on that, that will be announced. Um, additionally, we had very light attendance um, uh, from other uh, Planning Commission members um, at the last meeting. So I would like to make a pitch that for the next meeting we have a more robust attendance and I will make sure to announce the meeting uh, multiple times to everyone. Um, but you know, understanding it's a summer and there was some absolutely glorious weather that evening and you know, people are vaccinated now, we understand we're competing with things that are to a point outside of our control, but it is always better to have a more robust conversation than just me doing a monologue. Thank you, Commissioner Steinberger. Yes, I will try to get to that. Thank you, everyone. Very good. Um, you did all did get a copy of from Commissioner Siegel the update on the uh, Pentagon City PDSP um, report. Um, and Commissioner Hughes is not here today for the advisory committee. Um, one thing um, I did ask if anybody has ideas for the legislative wish list. We're probably a bit late on that. Um, if there is anything, um, one thing with the perennial, if we could get rid of Dylan's rule, that would be wonderful. Um, can always hope for the best. Um, other than that, if anybody has ideas, please forward them on to me. Um, and as I also mentioned, there will not be a recess meeting this month. Uh, today is our only meeting um, for June. And there, as traditional, there will not be a planning commission meeting in August. Uh, we'll next be meeting in person in September and information on how that's going to work, um, either fully in person or hybrid, we'll figure that out over the summer and I'll be getting information on to you about that. Um, I do want to thank, um, thank you staff, applicants and members of the public for time, consideration and patience this evening. And the items heard this evening will be going to the county board on July 17th or 20th. And Planning Commissioner Sarley is designated to represent us um, at those county board hearings. Um, now, many staff labor to make this virtual meeting run smoothly. And I thanks to all of you, um, especially want to uh, mention uh, our clerk, Ms. Johnson, uh, Joanne Harrison, and Supervisor uh, Matt Pfeiffer, as well as our uh, Mr. Tech, David Wood, uh, for making this all happen. And with that, um, I make this meeting adjourn. See everybody in September, if not at as near, at LRPCs in the next coming weeks. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.